Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we're so delighted that you have welcomed us into your home. Now, we want to hear from you, so send us an email with a question or a comment, possibly about today's show, to Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. Well, today our guest is John Carmichael, and he's going to be sharing about his reversion. Continuing his story. Continuing his story. You know, I think um, I'm sure many of us in our lives have been affected by the disease of alcohol. Maybe we had family members who were alcoholics, and uh, John shared, you know, just how that takes <clears throat> over the whole family. Yeah. One person may be. Uh, drinking, but it affects <coughs> the marriage, it affects the family, you know, yeah. and there's, yeah. uh, there's this illusion in life that, oh, I'm just going to take one drink, but then what happens is the drink takes the man, yeah. and um, yeah. because we all think we can do it, but every single day, whether you're in the church, you're out of the church, um, wherever you are on your journey, everybody <laughs> needs to surrender to Jesus. Yes. We all need to be converted, not once, but every day. Yeah. We need to bend our knee to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and say, my greatest prayer, God, help me. Well, we heard from him about the alcoholism in his family, and thank God his mother came through that and was sober, and then his own alcoholism, a divorce, and it's, uh, it's a story beyond alcohol. I mean, right. It's a story of the human person and right. the struggle to, to believe, to have faith. It's a story of rebelliousness and then it's a story of just not seeing and ignorance mm -hmm. and the human condition and what you go through, yet God never giving up. Uh, his baptism really being effective in his life, even though he was reared in the church and never quite got it. Other people that God brings into your life. And I remember in, in hearing his uh, testimony uh, from Marcus, there's a couple of times in there where maybe it's in, in you know, something else I've read. Um, but there's a, a priest, and I think there's a nun, referring to great things about the Lord, and, and John doesn't believe, but then they say, the Catholic faith is true. It's all true, John. Mm. J just like matter of fact, the nun says it, and the priest says, it's all true. The confession's true, deliverance is true. I just prayed a prayer of deliverance. It's all true. Mm. And we need people that could say that genuinely. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's all true, not just doctrinally, but experientially. I yeah. know it's true. Right. And so let's, uh, let's uh, get back to John. Let's hear the, the good news and how Christ really reached him and delivered him and set him on a beautiful course that to this day, he's declaring the wonders of our Lord. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. You're going to be greatly encouraged. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and we are sharing a beautiful story of reversion with John Carmichael. Well, John, we spent that first show going through your kind of journey and your history and being a Catholic young boy in your own family, reared within the Catholic Church, so many beautiful things, but never quite, you know, getting it or really believing it. Uh, benefiting by a lot that the Catholic Church offers academically, educationally, um, and yet still never getting it. Uh, the impact of alcohol in the home. You're never taking a drink for so many years, then taking a drink and divorce, all these different things that are taking place and the pain that's there. And at the end of the show, you started sharing about uh, San Juan Capistrano. You uh, talked about Pope Benedict's teaching, uh, allowing that Latin Mass to return, and that drawing you back to the church. So, take t tell us about you know the turn back to the church. What's going on? Sure. Well, I I, I was d deeply alcoholic at that point, but not understanding it really. It was just had just become a way of life. Uh, my relationships were failing. Um, everything was failing. I, I was having a very hard time functioning 
But I went to the Latin Mass down at the Mission, and um, I got involved in the choir. Uh, my favorite part of my own book is when I write about going to the Latin Mass for the first time and, and walking into the, the Unipro Serra Chapel, which there. is, yeah. yeah, it's a place, it's, it's one of the only original mm -hmm. places where Father Unipro Serra, now Saint Unipro Serra, yeah. offered Mass. Mm -hmm. And there are reports of a lot of conversions. I didn't know anything about that walking in there. I really was being kind of blindly led. I just wanted to go. Yeah. And it's not like I was behaving in any way well. Mm -hmm. But I was just shattered by, by what I was just in tears after it. And I didn't understand it, didn't understand why. So then I, I joined the choir, and the choir members know what's wrong with me, but they don't tell me immediately what they know <laughs> about why my life is a disaster. They just kind of suggest maybe I should go up and see the Norbertine Fathers at St. Michael's Abbey, yeah. and maybe I should think about a general confession, and probably shouldn't be receiving the Eucharist in the meantime. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then one of them handed me a rosary, and uh, the 54 day novena to Our Lady of Pompeii and said, you may want to pray this, you know, it's, it's all for Jesus through Mary. And I found myself praying the rosary, which mm -hmm. was just, I thought that was just kind of a uh, over with yeah. thing that mm -hmm. my grandmother did. Mm -hmm. But I, and I remember the various places on the beach, walking the dogs, I was like, why am I doing this? You know, and it's 50, the 54 day novena is arduous because mm -hmm. it's 27 days of petition and 27 days in thanksgiving, whether you've received the thing that you're praying for or right. not. And all I was praying for was, you know, help me. Like you mm -hmm. said in your intro, what mm -hmm. is wrong? I, why is my life like this? I'm in so much pain. My mother's dying. I'm just I'm failing. I was voted most likely to succeed in grade school and in high school. And, and now it's just clearly I'm, I'm failing. And I can't. I can't work it out. Things just keep getting worse and worse. So I finished, and I thought, all right, I did it. And think about it again. Yeah. And then I was at a bar, <laughs> my favorite bar. I want to put a plaque there because this is where my little miracle happened. Like yeah. John Carmichael received a locution at this bar <laughs> in, in Laguna Beach. And the locution was, you should fast. And I know it was a locution. I didn't know what a locution was at the time, but I would have never, it would have never occurred to me to voluntarily give up food for any reason. <laughs> mm -hmm. I did eat what was there, and I drank the martini, and I left and went back to my little hovel in the canyon. And uh, then, the, then at mass, uh, the, the choir director handed me a book, and she said, you know, I've been meaning to give this to you. For some reason, I feel you and I could do this. This older woman had lost her husband recently. She said, I want a, I want a new start my life over in a way. And I said, well, what's, what is this book? She said, it's called Fasting. Mm -hmm. And it was literally days after I had that locution. Mm -hmm. So she and I set about in Lent of that year. We fasted for 21 days on liquids and things. And it, it was getting around and people were like, oh, John and uh, uh, you know, the choir director are doing this, this intense fast. I didn't know why I was doing this. And in the middle of this, I made my general confession. And uh, my mother had died around this period, a lot of phenomena around her death, which is in the book, way too much to get into here. I was at her bedside, praying the rosary, wondering again, why am I praying this rosary? I'm not, I'm not a guy that play, prays yeah. the rosary. Mm -hmm. this is, but I, here I am, and boy, you know, when you're at someone's deathbed, and you're saying, now and at the hour of our death, mm -hmm. over and over, pray for us, now and at the yeah. hour yeah. of our death. And it is the hour of someone's death. This mm -hmm. is sort of infused into my spirit, this idea. Well, she's going to die. I'm going to die. So this is going to be the hour of my death. It's suddenly, suddenly the idea of, of the rosary as a weapon, mm -hmm. the, the Padre Pio talked about that, mm -hmm. really, came, really came to life. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, but my general confession was rather uh, shocking because I did confess all my sins to the young Norbertine priest who heard it. And he didn't absolve me right away. He said, okay, well, based on what I've heard, I think think I need to pray a deliverance prayer over you. And I was like, deliverance? You mean like the banjo? This is Orange County. What do you mean? We don't do deliverance here. We surf and deliverance. Uh, you know, so he took me into the library out of the little confessional. And, at, and you alluded to this, this thing in, in your introduction, this moment where I said, Father, it's just hard for me to believe that this is, that this is real. 
And he didn't even look at me. He just, he just took his purple stole and he, was, he said, John, it's all real. Mm. And he was 32, I think, at the time. He'd had a 10-year formation. He knew exactly what had happened to me. And we went into the library and he got this big book. <laughs> he opens it and he says, kneel down. Like, this, this can't be happening, you know. And he put his, and he, and he begins, in omne patre et filii et spiritui sanctus, exorcise ote. Uh, I was like, I don't know a lot of Latin yet, but I know what that means. Right. And, it's directed uh, to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And probably for his benefit, having heard this confession. Uh, and then it was, oh, and he's, then he absolves me of my sins. And it was the strangest moment. It was like a kind of vacuum. And, and that was where I realized that it, this wasn't the end of this story. It was only the beginning. Mm -hmm. I went out in the parking lot and I got my second locution, which was God needs you sober. And it was at that moment I realized that I was an alcoholic. And I had been taking, you know, some drugs too, and I, that I was going to need to stop everything. I was like my mother and I was going to need to really be sober. And wow. that is the story that is purely, that part of it is purely supernatural because I didn't, there was no real counseling. There was no, um, boy, I read this passage in Imitation of Christ. But after that, I read Imitation of Christ mm -hmm. and all these Catholic books. And I started to become, I studied to be a third order Norbertine for two years. Uh, and boy, did they teach me things that were just shocking. You know, and that same priest who, who, uh, heard my confession was he was teaching us the, the third order candidates one night and he was talking about grace he wrote grace on the chalkboard and talking about he's talking about the mysterious workings of the soul and the holy ghost and how the how that can happen for different people and i raised my hand and i said well father what about like confession like like i mean i ended up in in your confessional is that actual grace and oh he said oh i see what you're asking he drew a line on the chalkboard and then he wrote actual grace on one side and sacramental grace on the other, mm -hmm. uh, or sanctifying grace. And I realized suddenly that this Catholic theology had the same rigor. It had the same firmness as, say, chemistry. Uh, you could study organic chemistry or inorganic chemistry. You draw the same line down the board. And so I started to learn the Catholic faith from the ground up. And I just, I was just stacks of books. I became something of a hermit. I'm not saying it was healthy what I was doing, but uh, I was just stunned. And I and I wrote Drunks and Monks, the first part of it, in that state. Mm -hmm. And then I set it aside and I had to finish it a little bit later. This is profoundly disorienting. Uh, and I've made many mistakes in my converted period, partly through ignorance, partly because I didn't really want to put myself under spiritual direction because... I'm a rebel, like, well, I want to do things my way a little bit. The flesh is hard to kill. Yeah, <laughs> sure. And um, so I made a lot of the mistakes that St. John of the Cross talks about in Dark Night of the Soul, okay. the, the beginners make. And that was validating because I saw that every time I had an experience, there was a name for it. Mm -hmm. It was in some, one of the writings of our doctors of the church, or it was in an encyclical or it was, it was somewhere available to me, and, and I thought, I'd better write this down. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like tell people. Yeah. Like, may, is this true? Yes. Are you, after my whole life, and you're telling me the, the Catholic faith is true, mm -hmm. the sacraments are actually supernatural channels of grace, yeah. and there are other things in there. I ended up doing an emergency baptism of a heroin addict that I was helping. We were both in recovery. His life got better immediately. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I thought, baptism seems to be real the confession and the deliverance seem to be real what about the eucharist what about maybe i should read about that hello you know mm -hmm. and then i then i had a sense of horror because i looked around and saw that these truths had seemed to be disregarded by the public in general and you know many catholics i i ended up studying about the enemies of the church and the you know two three hundred year attack on the church and this is very very dark stuff this is, you know because you're talking about you're talking about spiritual warfare which I had never really mm -hmm. heard about there were mm -hmm. moments of grace where I asked my choir director you know do you have any books on uh, spiritual warfare she had a whole home library mm -hmm. and I read the spiritual combat by Dom Scapoli and I it was like having uh, 
talk about the ice water ice bucket challenge like <laughs> wow i'm way off i'm i'm a, i read that and the imitation of christ in the same month and mm -hmm. i was just startled and then i studied protestantism and well what was that whole argument about I said, wow the catholics have this running away you know just as uh, using ordinary intelligence and being honest i didn't really have a dog i didn't have confirmation bias at that point i was just letting it kind of mm -hmm. come in and i mm -hmm. thought this is yeah. and, I, and i had a hard time doing normal things for a while and i still i think the key mistake i made in my conversion was thinking that that my life should go on in in many ways as it had it been called to some very very serious kind of warfare it's it's in the family it's in the world it's in our nations it's in mm -hmm. the church mm -hmm. it appears to be um it appears to be what we were warned it was and uh and this is not something I had in mind, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. at 20 or 25. Yeah, or, right. uh, so uh, I, I haven't uh, done more than drunks and monks because I didn't want to, I didn't want to cheapen it in a way, turn it into some kind of like money make, you know, where you, you have a ministry, you mm -hmm. need to have some money mm -hmm. behind it. And uh, it was so raw, so pure, it said nothing to do with anything but this, this supernatural and preternatural dimension and its effects in the world. I, I neglected my, some of my duties as a publisher and as a person who lives on planet Earth still. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the, we're, we're not in heaven yet. And, and the, the church militant, the, some of the work we do is, is, is very confusing. It's the fog of war and you're not sure. Um, these are mistakes I've made and a lot of other ones too. So I don't want to be the person that comes on, on your show mm -hmm. and says, oh, I'm now this wise oracle. I've had a lot of trouble mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. continuing seven mm -hmm. years sober. Mm -hmm. um, I'm retooling. And, and this, is, this is what our great spiritual writers say okay. that, like Gregor Lagrange in Three Ages of the Interior Life says, a lot of people who want to do the Catholic spiritual life will look at Mount Everest and say, well, I want to start halfway up. And they won't do the ascetic work Mm -hmm. that John of the Cross was talking about. And so the foundation is poor and you're going to slide down and you're going to have to start over. So in a sense now I've studied and I've learned some of the pitfalls of the Catholic mm -hmm. spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mission now, I, I want to tell people it's true, the sacraments are real, I'm calling people to conversion. Uh, I, I feel... Um, I, I feel I don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. And some of the things I've tried in a secular way since then have not really worked out. The only thing that really has gone well is the book mm -hmm. <laughs> and the relationships that I've made from it. A lot of the other things I've tried in business or professional life have actually been very fruitless. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, this is, you know, God, when God shuts a door, mm -hmm. he really means it. Right. You know, <laughs> and I think yeah. there's, the, there's certain doors have been shut to right. me. And there's one that's open, and it seems to be all having to do with our faith, mm -hmm. which I don't think I fully understand or I've been as diligent as I need to be, but mm -hmm. you're calling me, mm -hmm. uh, I think, kind of begins this new cycle. So I've been doing a lot of stuff, I'm yeah. editing a book on Padre Pio. Mm -hmm. And actually, since you're, you're a spiritual daughter of I am. Pio, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I forgot my glasses for this segment, well, um, I have glasses. Yeah, I turned 49 this year, and uh, reading so I'll read. Yeah. I'll read with Joyce. They're glasses. good specs. Yeah. So uh, this this author that I'm working with is someone very close to me, and she is a spiritual daughter of Padre Pio. So we're we're doing all this work, <laughs> and so this is about marriage. Mm -hmm. And this woman, one of his first, his first spiritual daughter, Giovanna Rizzani. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, use uh -huh. the hand for that. And uh, she asked if she ought to become a nun. And Pio replied, Christ does not want you on Mount Tabor, but on Calvary. Mm -hmm. Religious life is Tabor. Of course, that's the site of the transfiguration. Mm -hmm. Matrimony is Calvary. On Tabor, one seeks, one finds, and one lives united with God in prayer and in contemplation. On Calvary, one finds suffering and crucifixion with Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's a hard sell for you know twenty year olds entering sure. into the married life, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's nonetheless I think 
as experience proves. Mm -hmm. And it's a way, if we understand the Catholic spiritual life, to unite our sufferings to Christ, mm -hmm. to see, I think I'll take these mm -hmm. off now, <laughs> to, to see Jesus in the face of the family members that are annoying you mm -hmm. yeah. or causing you great difficulty. It's an opportunity for people to work out their salvation. Right. And, but in order to do that, we would have to have formed Catholic men and Catholic women who mm -hmm. could marry with this understanding of what, what life is really about, which mm -hmm. is salvation. And then they could, and, and they would, I, I think the best thing a, a married couple could do is, is weekly confession. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you, because I think that melts away yeah. a lot of the built up resentments and anxieties and frustrations mm -hmm. in the priest. Can, can give the counsel that would, right. would improve Thank the marriage. You. On Thank the you spot. for those insights. We're going to hold you over for the final segment. It's John Carmichael. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, we have been discussing the, fa the Catholic faith today with John Carmichael. Before we wrap up our discussion, let's check in with Joan Lewis. Now, Joan, Pope Francis wrote his first encyclical on faith, didn't he? Well, hi again, Jim and Joy. Greetings to everyone from Rome and greetings to everyone at home. It's always good to be back with you on a Friday, especially today, when you have such an interesting theme, and that is to say the role of faith in family relationships. And you know, we really can't talk about that without referring to the papal encyclical Lumen Fide, the light of faith. Now this was the first encyclical written by Pope Francis, and it was published on the 29th of June, 2013, and actually just less than four months since he was elected, on March 13th of that same year. And interestingly enough, the encyclical was intended to be issued um, in conjunction with the October 2012, November 2013 um, year of faith. That, of course, was proclaimed by Benedict. And interestingly enough, this is the only encyclical so far written by two popes because Benedict began it. We know he then resigned. And then, of course, Pope Francis uh, concluded that document. Now, there's two beautiful numbers or paragraphs in that document that refer to what we're talking about today, the relationship between family and faith. And um, in number 52, we read paragraph 52 in part. Faith helps us grasp in all its depth and richness the begetting of children as a sign of the love of the Creator who entrusts us with the mystery of a new person. And then beautiful, paragraph number 33 on this is really beautiful. It says, in the family, faith accompanies every age of life beginning with childhood. Children learn to trust in the love of their parents. This is why it's so important that within families, parents encourage shared expressions of faith and that can help children gradually grow up, of course, in their own faith. Faith, says the document, is no refuge for the faint-hearted, but something that enhances our life. It makes us aware of a magnificent calling, the vocation of love. It assures us that love is trustworthy and worth, embra and worth embracing because it's based on God's faithfulness, which is stronger than any of our weaknesses. So beautiful words. Again, remember that faith is not a refuge for the faint-hearted, but something that enhances our life. So. Uh, time's up here, but back to you. Joan, thanks so much for building up the family with your sharing today. Well, John, you were dead, but you're alive. Mm -hmm. You're blind. You see. What's the word for the church, for us, to better help people like you that were on that journey? I would tell them that the Catholic faith is true. Mm. It's the bottom line. And um, that is a very, very dangerous thing to say in the world today. It's uh, because the truth displaces that which is contrary to it. We know from Thomas Aquinas and really from logic in general that A cannot equal not A. So if, mm -hmm. it's, if it's not consistent with Catholic truth, I would, I would argue 
we should set it aside and get back to the basics and really absorb uh, the entire mind of the faith, of the Christian faith, which is co-equal with the mind of God. Mm. John, thank you so thank much you. for sharing your life, your word, and pointing us to Jesus and to his church. So we thank you for being with us today. I'll be having surgery uh, next week, so you'll be seeing some re-airs of some of our favorite shows. So I ask your prayers during that time. Remember, we're a family, and you're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now. <laughs>